The Doppler effect is a phenomenon that occurs when a receiver of waves is in a different frame of reference than the emitter. The different energy states of our reference frames lead to differences in measured energy levels in the wave. The universe is rapidly expanding and thus all faraway points in space are moving further and further from each other's frames of reference. So when light arrives, it appears far weaker than one would expect. This is called redshift. As touched upon in my previous video, points in space expand away from each other based off Hubble's constant. This is a measured factor predicting that points in space expand from one another at around 70 kilometers a second every megaparsec between them. On a universal scale, this speed is inconsequential, but over extreme vast distances, that cumulative 70 kilometers per second adds up and eventually points in space begin expanding away from each other at relativistic speeds. Waves are energy, and energy must be conserved. So when we see light or hear sound waves, it can seem strange that they possess more or less energy than they originally did. But the first law of thermodynamics is safe, as this change in energy can be found by the difference in energy states of our reference frames. A frame of reference is simply how you describe something's motion based off something you define as motionless. A good rule of thumb is using whatever you're gravitationally bound to. So your and my motion would be defined by the Earth, the Earth's motion would be defined by the Sun, and the Sun's motion would be defined by the center of the galaxy. However, you can choose and change your frame of reference at will. The biggest difference between an adept and struggling physics student is how you choose your frame of reference. I'm going to imagine you've probably already seen a video or demonstration of the Doppler effect using sound waves, and there's plenty of sources that can visualize that as well as I could. What we're going to explore soon, however, is the relativistic Doppler effect. The Doppler effect occurs because waves always move away as fast as their medium allows them. Unlike particles, they don't inherit the velocity of their emitter. Waves leave an emitter at the same speed regardless of the emitter's velocity. This results in a very visible clumping and stretching of waves along the direction of motion. But anyone in the same frame of reference wouldn't observe these changes as their motion counteracts these compressions and stretches. Relativity shows that light always has the same speed or velocity in whichever frame of reference you choose. Therefore, the only difference between light in one reference frame and another is the energy it possesses. And since a light's energy is dictated by its wavelength, then the only difference between light in one reference frame or another is its wavelength. Redshift is always described as space stretching light out. And we'll find out soon this is an acceptable explanation, but it's also a little deceiving to the true nature of light and our universe. Light or photons are simply an excitation of the electromagnetic field. They don't have any dimensions. You can't stretch a point. That notion doesn't make sense. Because light doesn't have rest mass, it must move. And since it moves at C, or the speed of light, it mathematically doesn't have a reference frame. If, however, we then describe light using an arbitrary frame of reference, we can plot its movement along with its oscillation, and now we can visualize and describe it by its wavelength. Wavelength is a description of light, not something it physically has. By focusing on its wavelength, it then makes sense to say the expansion of space has stretched out our light's wavelength. But this is a bit deceiving. Alright, so the relativistic Doppler effect. Even though light is a quantum object and we could describe it as a singular particle, you can only explain the Doppler effect when we visualize light as a wave. You can explain it using Newtonian physics, which I will right at the end, but it's not physically accurate. As a wave impinges or collides with a surface, the crests impact a certain amount of times over a specific time period. We use seconds as the time period and thus hertz as the frequency. The inverse of frequency, therefore, is how long it takes for a single crest to arrive after another. This is called the period. When the object or wall in which our wave is colliding with is moving away from the direction of propagation, 
Then the distance, and therefore time, each subsequent crest needs to travel before colliding with our wall, increases. If motionless, our wavelength is simply the speed of the wave times the period. However, now our wavelength is the speed of the wave times our new period, and our new wavelength is the old wavelength plus the recession speed of the wall times the new period. We have one unknown, so we can solve this equation. We just rearrange it first to isolate the new period, and in doing so we can clean it up a bit and introduce a new variable beta. Now when we isolate t, we can move c to the left side. Lambda over c is the inverse of frequency. We can now calculate the new period. Or, better yet, the inverse of the period is the frequency. Our new redshifted frequency is the original frequency minus the same frequency times beta, or the ratio between the two speeds. Now that we see it requires a little extra time for our wave crests to impinge after another, it's important to ask, relative to who? As our objects begin receding from each other at relativistic speeds like we see from spatial expansion over billions of light years, time slows down relative to one another. So we need to apply a Lorentz transformation to our new frequency. And this is actually really simple. A Lorentz transformation tells us how the perceived dilation of time or contraction of space appears on a fast-moving reference frame compared to someone outside of it. So if we look at the new frequency from our previous Doppler formula, this new frequency is what we would expect to see if time passed the same as it does at the source of light. However, it doesn't. So we just apply a Lorentz transformation. Now we can predict our new frequency at relativistic speeds. When redshift is described as space stretching the wavelength, it's done so because it's simply easier, and technically not wrong. But what's actually happening is that during the light's journey from wherever it was emitted, Earth's frame of reference continues to expand or accelerate away from the light's current position in space. This rate of acceleration decays as the light gets closer, but when light takes multiple billions of years to reach Earth, it has a long time to keep accelerating from the source's reference frame. Lastly, what about a singular photon? Light can indeed be described as a particle, so redshift should make sense on a particle sense. And it does, but also due to the nature of light, doesn't. Even though light doesn't have mass, it has momentum. So we can simply picture a Newtonian example. If a particle collides with a wall, its strength of impact can be strengthened or weakened by moving the wall towards or away from the particle. A Newtonian particle gets its momentum because each particle has its own unique frame of reference, whereas a light's momentum is dependent on the frame of reference which measures it. Not to mention, to whoever observes the light on impact, it appears to be traveling at the correct speed of light. So it's not a great way to visualize it, but conceptually, yes, the acceleration away from points in space means when a particle of light reaches us, it's lost a lot of its momentum. And that's why we experience a redshift of ancient intergalactic light.